And there we go, we should be live. Hello, welcome to the latest Pink and Live video. Dave Freezer here, alongside Connor Southwell and Paddy Davitt. As you can see, we've brought out the knitwear. It's uh, it's only October, but uh, it's already freezing cold. So uh, I was just admitting to Connor that um, I've used our new cat, or well, she's a kitten, as an excuse to put the heating on. So uh, it's on very low, but um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm hiding behind. But since we last um, spoke to you, in this kind of a video on Monday when we were discussing Ben Godfrey's club record sale, which of course kicked off the week in, in quite a busy fashion. There's been, there's just been so much stuff going on throughout the week um, for, for an international break. Uh, there's just loads, loads to discuss. So we thought we'd, uh, we thought we'd catch up, but um, Pad, just, we've got a little bit of sort of breaking news really, haven't we, in, in regards to, to Adam Eder's situation with Ireland. Can you sort of catch us up on that? Yeah, basically where we are with that day, but we'll, we'll start with the background. Um, last night, the Republic are playing Slovakia in their playoff semi final. Seven forty five. Team news drops an hour before. No Adam Eder. Not in the sense of okay, he's not in the eleven, but he wasn't even in the on the bench and having made his debut previously. Um very strange. And as it turns out, it's uh, transpired that him and Aaron Connolly, very good young player from Brighton, um, were deemed to be close contacts of a member of Ireland's backroom team who tested positive for coronavirus, um, was negative before they left Dublin, but had, had returned a positive test at Slovakia. And it, it would appear that um, basically the, they were sat in close proximity to him on the plane journey out. Um, Ireland's COVID uh, protocols appear to be a bit more stringent, according to Stephen Kenny, their, their manager, if it, the game had been taking place in the UK, that would have been fine, in his words. But uh, as it was, um, they had to sit out the game. And obviously then, you know, uh, all sorts of questions needed to be answered then. But um, I've been in touch with Norwich this morning. He's already travelled back, Adam Eda. Uh, he's already been tested by the club. And then they will now await the results. And while they wait the results, he will self-isolate. So there's no danger of him... Um, being anywhere near any other member of Daniel Farker's coaching team or players. And obviously, first and foremost, it's about the health of Adam Eder. But Stephen Kenny said after the game, they're both perfectly fine, not showing any symptoms. So it, it looks like a very safety first attitude from the Irish, uh, firstly. And, and then Norwich will obviously follow on from that because we have the, the parallel of Marco Steepman um, at, the, at the start of the project restart period in the Premier League where he returned a positive test. Um, subsequently returned to negative tests, but for that period, he wasn't available. I think he missed the Southampton game. They, as a precaution, Norwich kept him away, kept him away from the group. Um, so the question does still remain, obviously, will Adam Eder now be in Daniel's thoughts for Rotherham? Uh, and we won't know that, I guess, until they get the results back. Uh, and even then, they might err on the side of caution, um, because obviously, as we know, sadly with this, uh, there are incubation periods and there's a certain amount of days that have to pass before you can say definitively but it looks like it's just a precaution um, but unfortunately it's the world we live in now so um, you know there was two Scottish players were unavailable and they're now again probably because of the territory they're in they're having to self-isolate one of whom is Arsenal's Kieran Tierney he's going to miss games for Arsenal in the next 14 days uh, and that was all a result of Stuart Armstrong another member of the Scotland team who did test positive so it's the world we live in. You know, we've seen at Liverpool, Sadio Mane, and I think um, the Swiss lad whose name escapes me now, uh, Shakiri. I think they've both tested positive in the last week. Um, it is the new rea is the new reality and Norwich aren't immune to it, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't uh, avoid it. We don't want to be talking about COVID, do we? But that means he misses Nations League games this weekend against Wales and Finland, of course, um, Pookie in, in the same group as, as Ida. Um, but let's go through the week sort of chronologically a little bit then. Um, Connor, if I come to you about the the rebates uh, system that the club announced, this was Tuesday, wasn't it? And um, in, in general, the reaction that I've seen seems to be that the club have played this one quite well and, and covered off all angles. But essentially, it comes down to that the the payments that were being made for season tickets are now being sort of knocked on to, to the next season, aren't they? Yeah. So if, if you've had, as many supporters have, and I've been sort of asked a few times by some family members and, and some other supporters um, about sort of where we we're at in terms of the direct debits, because they were still seeing money being taken out of their account every month and Obviously, they can't attend games at the moment, so there was a bit of confusion as to why that was the case. And um, essentially, the club are saying that if you can continue to play those direct debits, and then it will be pushed forward for your for your 2020-21 um, uh, season ticket. 
um, should you wish. Equally, if you have been paying the direct debit, so if you paid in full, you can still claim a refund. Um, and you can also reserve your seat. So if you want the money back now because of a, your f financial situation, um, you can. it doesn't necessarily mean that you are without your season ticket. You can reserve your seat and then there'll be a small window in March next year where you can um, basically set up your payment again, whether as a direct debit or in full, um, to, to guarantee your seat. So it, it gives people enough flexibility. Of course, if you do do that, you aren't then provided with the iFollow um, luxuries and... Um, and stuff like that but of course it's it's kind of it kind of allows everyone regardless of their situation to make a judgment of, of what is the best for them to do at the moment and obviously there'll be some people who are able to continue those payments and, and support the club and there'll be some people who aren't so um yeah I, I think the reaction as a whole was was fairly positive and um I, I think the club despite perhaps a few little contradictory parts that um that have subsequently been addressed um communicated it really well and um i think most supporters are, are pretty appreciative of the situation at the moment and uh yeah it seems to have gone down fairly positively so far which is which is good news i think for everyone because supporters don't really want to be in a place where they're where they're a bit confused about what's going on yeah they they had to get something done and of course that i think most fans can sympathize that it's not an easy situation for for clubs before you even get into the financial side of it so um a little bit of clarity um always good we've got our first comment in i should just say um as you're scrolling along at the bottom of the screen if you want to put in any uh, questions or comments to us then, then do get them in you should be able to via youtube facebook or uh, Periscope by Twitter. Uh, first one here from Aidy Sedgwick. Um, I think might have got some duff information, but I'll put this to you, Pad. Um, hi, guys. Hope you're all doing really well. Just wondered if there's any truth in that we're signing Ryan Bennett on a permanent deal, also signing Angus Gunn on a season loan. I do honestly think we do need to sign at least one centre-half. What do you guys think? Um, I've not seen any suggestion of that from any kind of reliable sources, and unless I've missed it, Pad. No, no, ditto. Um, I have seen those names circulating in that, that great sort of expanse of social media. Um, but logically, Angus Gunn, what does that mean? Tim Krull, is Tim Krull suddenly going to sit to one side or is Tim Krull off somewhere? So, no, I think um, I wouldn't put too much store by that one. The Ryan Bennett thing, he was linked, wasn't he, uh, about a month or so ago. But um, again, I think that's more of his Norfolk connections and he's made no secret that you know, from a family perspective, when he hangs up the boots, he'll he'll return to Norfolk. But um, the here and now, no, I'm trying to think now. I did see him linked with another club. Um, I can't name the, of the identity. Fulham, was it? Yeah. So, you know, there's a Premier League entity. I still think there might be a club down the lower end of the Premier League who might think. And with that one, for me, it'd be the financials around it. You know, he's a free agent. Norwich are working to a very tight budget now going into this season. The previous topic we've just talked about, that's going to increasingly impinge you know, on, on everything they're trying to do because they're not getting any revenue from fans. And Ben Kensel's press release that the club put out was tens of millions of pounds. Well, it doesn't exist in a void. They're a self-funded club, so increasingly that will lap over into football decisions. And, and that, to me, would rule out a Ryan Bennett deal just on the financials, um, aside from the fact they they seem to be looking at maybe in the in the post Ben Godfrey post him closer world, maybe looking potentially to promote younger uh, Omadama Bailey. Uh no, I've not pronounced that at all right, have I? No. Omar, Omar, Connie, Omar Omar Daily. Omadama Daily, yeah. Who's uh, I believe another very talented Republic of Ireland youth international. So um yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing a bit more of him. But by all accounts he's been very good this season. Um Played again in that midweek romp, I think it's safe to call it, at Newport. And Daniel is looking at him as a viable one to fast track in, as as a, as he's done with Adam Eder, as he's done with Josh Martin in more recent times. So, no, for all those reasons, Ryan Bennett coming back, no, nah, doesn't make sense. And as I say, I, I, Angus Gurn, I'm not sure where that one's come from at all, because are we saying Tim Krull's moving on? Hopefully not. Um, just got himself back in the Holland team for that friendly against Mexico. So, I think we can put a line through those two lads. Yeah, um, I think Angus is potentially available on loan, isn't he, from Southampton? So I guess people are sort of making that uh, assumption. But a, a couple more comments here. Uh, Julian Scott says, we're closer off to Switzerland. Are we flirting with disaster at the back again? And James Lewis Hilton, interested in Joel Latteboudier. I think I'm getting that right. Very well done. <laughs> Young lad from Manchester City. Any thoughts on this? Um, so 
Connor, that that's one that we've sort of been able to to rule out quite quickly, isn't it? This Manchester City lad, but in general, obviously people people are fretting a little bit over the the lack of cover, as Pat's hinted at there. We'll come on to close his exit in a little bit more depth in just a minute, but. Um, the immediate sort of concern is that, and you've had a, a bit of a deeper look into to what Amabama Daly has, has achieved so far, haven't you? Yeah, he's, um, he's he's one that they've signed from Ireland, and uh, obviously you only need to look at Adam Eder for the success of that. But they've also brought in um, uh, William Hondemark as well, who's who's come from Ireland, and a few other players who are, who are in their academy at the moment. So it's it's an area that they believe there is quality. Um, there and, and they've brought a few options over. Ida is, is obviously the most prominent example, but um, I think if if Omabamadele does come through and then um, obviously Honda Mark is, is doing quite well in the 23s at the moment, then we might see a sort of um, a few of these young Irish players come off the block. He's in a, in a few quotes from an interview last year. He, he said that he likes Virgil Van Dyke and he tries to sort of style his game on him. Which is, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. And the, he did he did have a sem- similar ha- haircut at one stage, although I think he's ditched yeah. that now. Um, so I think he, he probably sees himself as a fairly modern centre back. I mean, I haven't, I've only seen him play. I think in, in for the 18s last year in the Youth Cup. So uh, in terms of what he's actually like on the pitch, you're, you're probably a better place to comment, Dave, because you watched the Newport game the other day. But um, I, I remember him being quite, quite big, quite physical, and um, fairly refined on the ball as well. Next to um, Tomkinson as well, who's a young lad in their academy. So. Um, I think the the current 23s group is one they hold a lot of promise for anyway, but him in particular, um, I think Irish footballers tend to come over here with, as you've seen with Ida, that physicality already. It's about sort of unlocking the the technical and tactical side of their game. And yeah, now ultimately it's up to Daniel Farker to to decide if he's good enough. And as he always says, he'll take him to the door and it's up to him to walk through it really. But you've also got Alex Tetty and as as we'll come on to, Jakob Sorensen as well, who can cover in that position. So I don't think there's particularly a necessity to sign anyone on loan. Equally, I think it would be very difficult to, given that you're you're going to be trying to persuade a Premier League club to depart with probably a young talent without the guarantee that they're going to get first team football. So that's a really difficult situation to be in um, for a club. And yeah, it's it's difficult to see how it goes. But I think we'll see Omabama Dele sort of step into that step into that hole as he has done. He was on the bench against Luton as well. So um he's had sort of drips of first team experience and um now it's up to him to take this opportunity. But as Daniel Farquhar always says, he, he doesn't hand out any gifts. So it's going to be up to him now. But um, yeah, from from how he speaks about himself, it's, it's really interesting. He certainly sees himself as, as a modern centre-back. And that, that means someone who who is fairly good with the ball at, at their feet. And we know that that is what Daniel Farquhar looks for in his defenders. Yeah, that, that, that game you mentioned, the under-21s winning 5-0 at Newport on Tuesday night. EFL Trophy, that means the under-21s have qualified for the knockout stages now. They go to Cheltenham early November when that's basically a shootout for who finishes um, top of the group. And despite the win of 5-0, yeah, I thought Omobama Daly was one of the best players, to be honest. He, he showed a real maturity. He was wearing the captain's armband. He was composed. Uh, Norwich's defence stuck to their task and they they totally deserved that win. Newport did make 11 changes to their team. Uh, they're top of League Two. They've reached the fourth round of the League Cup, so they've had a busy start. Um, Tristan Abrahams, the former Norwich player, who's one of their sort of frontline strikers, stayed on the bench during the game, but they still had a lot of experience. There's a couple of 30-year-olds, a 41-year-old in Kevin Ellison playing, who um, somebody told me on Twitter afterwards was playing for Stockport in the game at Carrow Road on the final day of the 2002 season when Norwich snuck into the playoffs under Nigel Worthington. So um, he probably played against David Wright, to be perfectly honest. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't checked that, but that would have been about his uh, time with, with Crew and, and Norwich and Ipswich and stuff, wouldn't it? So, um, yeah, I like the look of him. He, he's he's big, he's strong. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see whether he can feel like that. I mean, there is a short, short gap, isn't there, between transfer windows because we're in this sort of unprecedented calendar in, in the football world. But w- one name that has also been bounced about, Pad, is um, this young lad at Arsenal, William Saliba. But, but again, we've not really seen that from any um, any reliable sources yet, have we? And, you know, if you bring in young lads like that, it, does it really make any sense? Or are you better to, to de- develop one of your own? Well, I mean, that is the debate, isn't it? But um, yeah, with him particularly, I think, again, the finances are around that. And also, I, I think... Previous club was St Etienne. He went back there on loan last season, and uh, I think maybe one of the reasons potentially he was going back there again this time round, it's fallen down at the eleventh hour. But I think Arsenal were very keen on getting guarantees on first team football. Um, now, would Norwich be able to do that? For example, even if we get into the finances and making that deal happen, so 
you know, I've seen Watford, I've seen Brentford this morning, funny enough, link with him. And I think they're probably better fit, certainly Watford, because the finances wouldn't be an issue and the close proximity to London as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't necessarily see that happening. But but clearly, Stuart Webber and his recruitment team are not doing their job if between now and the end of the window. They're not looking at the Premier League loan route, despite the inevitable difficulties there would be in getting those type of players, whether in terms of guarantees of game time or the finances involved. You know, we all saw the Marcus Edwards Tottenham deal um, bombed in a quite a big way. Um, so, so there is an element of risk to that. But I think they have to be mindful, given that your three senior centre backs, one of them played his first game in, in how many years? Uh, ben Gibson last week. I'm being slightly flippant, but very little football in two years. And the other two, let's be honest, have been beset by injuries in the last 12, 18 months. Grant Hanley, you'd say maybe all of his Norwich career. So. There is a major element of risk to go forward now between now and January um, when they could do something else in the next transfer window with just those three centre-backs. Um, and you're talking Alex Tetti and Jakob Sorensen. I'm not sure Norwich's fan base are going to uh, accept that given you know they're unable to win games of football at the minute. So it all feels a little bit like a um, bit of a knife-edged decision that over the next few days of your Stuart Webber and his recruitment team, you either decide, no, we'll go with what we've got or you see what's out there. But... You know, at this stage, it probably is leaning more towards they're going to go with what they've got because, as you rightly say, Dave, um, you've got a young centre back there who's making uh, making some waves. Surely it's better to bring him in. And of course, you've got the likes of Akin for Maywell out on loan as well, who maybe become an option in January. So if it's almost just that bridge, um, because you're looking to do something again in January, is it worth it? And, and ultimately, they may decide it's not. Yeah, and kind of um, on Famer, there was some nice. Comments from uh, from Lee Bowyer, wasn't it? The Charlton boss, which is where he's gone on loan, of course. Yeah, he's uh, he's, he seems to be doing really well. He's only played two games. I think it was a, a two 0 defeat uh, against Lincoln, which he came off early in about sixty seven minutes, and then played a full ninety minutes last week um, when they drew nil nil with Sunderland, which is a, a pretty impressive result given how Sunderland have started and and obviously given their ambitions this season. Um, and there was also some some nice comments from Ben Amos, who's um, Charlton's goalkeeper, about how he communicates and and how important a presence he's been in that back line and how he's essentially made his job a little bit easier. So some really nice early comments from from Boya and, and and from Amos the, who are two I mean Boya is 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 obviously the the manager but Amos is is very experienced in in football as well and would have played in in front of a, a, a fair few decent defenders particularly at Millwall I'm, I'm thinking so um that that can only be good for him but as, as you say it's got to be the performances between now and January that he's got to aim to to really impress him because if there is that carrot of coming back to Norwich City in January and being in and around the first team and we all know how highly Norwich rate him then um that really is 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 a very attainable um objective for him to to be completely honest to impress in league one and then come back into the championship and, and stake his claim to be one of the two or three if Norwich moved to a three um center back so um really positive start for him at Charlton it's a brilliant loan move if he can get decent first team football they're, they're a club of ambitions of their own particularly after their takeover um and there's also some really good experienced pros in there Ben Watson has, has signed in recent days who of course, formerly of, of um, Nottingham Forest. So some really good players to learn under um, and learn with. And if he can get it right, then, yeah, I think what Pad said there about him possibly being recalled in January is a, a really obvious next step for him, really, providing he can do it, given how he performed at St Mirren last year as well, where he did impress. So good early signs and hopefully he can keep it up in, in the coming weeks. But of course, it's consistency for him now, which um, as, as a young player is very difficult. But He's seen what, what Ben Godfrey did at Norwich in terms of how he essentially really took off at Shrewsbury and then got given an opportunity at Norwich. So he's going to know it's there. Um, he's got something to play for. And now it's about proving it under under Lee Bowyer, who is, uh, is proven to be a, a very decent head coach at that level. Yeah, I spoke to him a couple of months ago, if I'm aware, about his St Mirren loan and how well that had gone. So um, I think the one the comparison you could make, I mean, he is a couple of years older than Omar Bama Daly, is that he looks more like a man. He is a big unit. He's bigger than Ben Godfrey. I, I, I'd say probably is bigger than any of the Norwich centre-backs. Um, for, you know, I've only just seen Gibson. But yeah, he, he seemed to tower over even Hanley. So... Um, not Zimmerman, he's not taller than Zimmerman, but he's he's a big unit fan away. So um, as far as we know, him and Bashiri can't be recorded until January now because they've made their loans. But um, that's going to be uh, going to be an interesting one to, to monitor. But just to come back to the under 21s game, of course, um, that caught a lot of people, a lot of people's attention because uh, a hat trick for Tyrese Omotoyi, uh 
who is 18, uh, apparently was born in Belgium, brought up in the UK. Connor, we saw a little bit of, of him in the, in the Youth Cup, didn't we? But um, I can't say he really stuck out in, in my mind too much. But that goal, I'm sure you've both seen the highlights back by, by now, but um, certainly the one that, that sealed his hat-trick was, was quite the finish. Yeah, it was. And, and he's, he seems to be fairly prolific at those levels as well. So so you have to say, really, the next step is, is probably a decent loan. And um, I, I just wonder whether they'd, they'd look to get him into into Belgium or possibly Holland. These are areas that we know that they they like their players to go out on loan to, and particularly maybe Telstar or um, or uh, Dordrecht, two of the options they've, they've got in Holland at the moment, where they, they like sort of players to go and play because it is a very technical division. So I, I could quite feasibly see him seeing him go out there in, in, in January, maybe, if not, then lower down the EFL pyramid. So there's going to be options for him, um, particularly if he continues to impress in that competition, because it's it's brilliant for for sort of lower league managers to to have a look at the talent that is out there. And Norwich City have it, have it in, a, in abundance. And he's one of the names that has caught the eye at the moment. I think he's, he's capped by the Belgium under-16s as well. So certainly got the um, the pedigree and yeah, I think the next step for him is is alone, and then hopefully he can he can look to be in around that first team squad. But certainly looks to play with a lot of potential and and quite well rounded as well for a centre forward, from what I've seen. Yeah, I like the look of him, and he's one like Omar Daly that they've got on a professional contract already, trying to avoid those avoid those situations that we've um, seen sometimes, and that happens quite a lot in academy football, where if they haven't yet signed a professional deal, then another club can come and swoop. You know, like Benny Ashley Seal at um, at Wolves, and, and the lad uh, Shaq Poke, who who's joined Villa, isn't he, um, this year? So. That's quite a common thing that happens in, in academy football, but also brilliant finish from Matthew Dennis for, for the fourth goal. Josh Martin put in a penalty for the fifth. But yeah, that, that fourth was was probably the pick of the bunch, just real control in off the post. And they, they totally deserve that win. So it's going to be uh, really interesting to see how they get on. Obviously, it's a bit of a hot topic in football. You know, you see the Man City um, chief executive this week talking about whether the league should restructure and things like that. So yeah. Um, Maybe it's maybe it would be better if Norwich aren't the first academy team to, to get to Wembley and into the final or, or something like that. But um, we shall see. And um, before that game, I was on I was on the live updates duty at Pinker.com throughout for Zoom call for the England under twenty ones ahead of their game, which was in Andorra on Wednesday. Um, spoke to Aidy Boothroyd and Oliver Skip. Um, you will have already seen a little bit of that Skip interview, uh, talking about how pleased he was to have won Player of the Month and things like that at Norwich. But um, the the main uh, chunk of that interview is going to be in tomorrow's Pink, and that will be online as well. So keep an eye out for that. But Boothroyd, um, I, I got a, a bit from him on on Todd Campwell and. Um, he didn't say that he'd spoken to Todd specifically about it, but he basically said, you need to focus on your football. If you're doing well on the pitch, then everything else will fall into place. And, um, you know, he, it seemed like he was a little bit concerned to hear that Todd's sort of um, out of favour. But um, then during the game, um, we got the news as well that Chris Hewton was uh, back in the championship pad, a, a man that you've interviewed many times uh, when he was the Norwich City manager. Uh, looks like a good appointment for Boris, doesn't it? And, mo- and would most often say the same thing in every interview, but he's a lovely fellow, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I think um, our esteemed colleague, Chris Lake, he asked me who's the, probably the best guy we've dealt with, might have even been one of these chats, and he was certainly the, the easiest going. He's such a lovely man. Yeah, I remember they got whacked 7-1, 7-0 up at Man City, funnily enough, Premier League season, and um, you go with trepidation if that's a Paul Lambert or whatever post-match, but he was... Uh, it was if they'd won seven one. He was just a very calm. I mean, I, I do actually you know. Thinking about this anecdote, he used to say, "Look, if we perform poorly, I expect what's coming down the track." And uh, that's all you can ask in the sort of relationship we need to have with these characters. But um, lovely to see him on a personal level back in because I think he's still got a lot to offer. Very experienced manager now. He's got promotions at this level with Newcastle and Brighton. Um, maybe felt a little bit hard done by at Brighton, but it seemed to track from a distance anyway, a little bit like his Norwich spell where they had a good season there and then they found it a lot tougher second time round. So he'll definitely have things to prove. And Forrest, I always think now, Forrest, massive club in terms of their potential, the fan base they've got there, the history speaks for itself, but they never seem to be able to get it going, certainly in recent years. And, and obviously that calamitous fallout of the playoffs on the final day last season, uh, I think Swansea picked them with that huge swing in terms of goals, wasn't it, on the final day? Um, and Sabri Lamushi paid with his job because this season hasn't started in the same fashion. But you, you're not unsurprised to see there was a bit of a hangover from that. But 
I don't know. I don't really know what he's got to play with in terms of resource. I've seen an interview with him in the last day or two where they're saying they're going to try and do a little bit in between now and the end of the window. You can't rule them out of being the shake-up because he knows what it takes to put a team together. But he himself is described it's probably his toughest job in terms of the expectation levels at that club. Um, they've obviously got very demanding owners. So I'm interested to see how that goes. And I think they're due at Car Road in early December. So it would be nice to see him, yeah. It certainly will. Um, and you know that he'll get them organised quickly and that they um, they will pick up. But, um, of course, the, the big news, really, we've only just touched on it a little bit so far. So let's let's discuss it properly now. Tim Close's exit confirmed on Wednesday morning and quite a, quite a lot of emotion swelling around, really, I, I'd have said. And, you know, I, he's a player that I always liked and, and certainly will always remember how well he played during the first half of the, of the title winning season. He was... He was outstanding and was quite often the, the man sort of starting moves. But um, I thought Darren Huckabee summed it up quite well when he said we were probably rub, robbed of his best days by injury. And really, Connor, I, I think most people have, have, have agreed with that, haven't they? And I, I don't think too many people have necessarily objected to, to allowing him to leave, even if it has made things a little bit nervous at the moment. Yeah, agreed. I, I think it's it's probably at his stage of his career. He's, what, 32 now? Um falling down the pecking order at Norwich and he needs first team football at this stage of his career and I think given the service he's given to Norwich City and you know he's he, he stayed at moments where perhaps other players wouldn't have and um, he's he's quite a classy defender on the pitch and, and, and quite classy off it as well I think um, maybe a bit eccentric at times but um, I, I think it's, it's a good assessment yeah I think the injuries did did rob the best days of him it, it kind of felt like every time he got into a, a period where we were beginning to see Tim Close's quality, then a major injury would hit and it would rule him out for a while and we wouldn't see him again. And then the process would happen um the next time he returned. So that that is a shame from that perspective. Yeah, but I, I don't I, I certainly don't think that Norwich fans begrudge him the move, particularly given it's so emotional for him being his his boyhood club and a return back to Switzerland. Um <clears throat> So it is. Um, it, it does leave Norwich short, but I think probably the best for all parties in terms of the options Norwich have at centre back, the um, the proposition of, of first team football for closer, and the stage he is at his career. It's not really in his interest to to sit around at Norwich um, watching his, his his career get sort of fall away from him and, and slip through his fingers. I think so. Um, it, it makes sense, and um, also. Hopefully, some some wages off the um, off, off the wage bill as well, which is which is going to be key, particularly at the moment. So, um, for all parties, I think it's a deal that makes sense. I think all parties will will shake hands, or maybe not shake hands at the moment, touch elbows, and, and wish each other well for the future. And, and that's kind of that's kind of um, where they are with it. But yeah, I think he'll he'll be remembered fondly by Norwich fans. I think as as time goes on, because um, he was he was a good servant and, and put in a lot of good performances and, and was very popular. I think amongst supporters but but also players as well yeah and pad I, I was going back through the the photos and that press conference that I, I guess we were both at um well I certainly was at, I can't remember if you were there <laughs> myself but um when he arrived and he was sat next to Stephen Naismith wasn't he and um it was a uh, quite a quite a jovial press conference to be honest and at the mo at the time it felt so big you know Norwich had just spent like 15 million pounds and that was supposed to be Alex Neal and David McNally you know getting them over the line to, to survive in the Premier League and that's where it's all started so it, it it's certainly been an eventful Norris City career for him hasn't it oh yeah absolutely yeah another lovely fellow talking to Chris Hewton but I think that was the best of him I think that period when he signed up until sadly he went over and did his knee ligaments at Palace towards the end of that Premier League season with Alex Neal that for me was was the moment Norwich has lost their battle to stay up because I think with him in the side, the way he was playing, he was he was emerging as such a leader in that back line as well. Um, he was fully fit and they may well have just squeaked themselves out of it. So who knows how from that point onwards, Tim Closer's career at Norwich may have gone on and developed. But um, I think the feeling was to, to go full circle when he came back in for the project restart period last year that inside the club, they felt his best days were behind him. Now that's harsh on one level, and he's referenced it in the media he's done since he joined Basel. He wasn't fit. You know, was it eight? Was it the thick end of 18 months where he hadn't really played any football? He had, he'd had a problem the second half of the title winning season. And then obviously he did his ankle ligaments, I'm going to say. I'd have to check that. But uh, Crawley in the uh, League Cup early in August. And he really got rushed back because Hanley was out, Zimmerman was out, and it looked like a player who hadn't played enough football. And to be thrown into a Premier League relegation fight, 
didn't do many favours, but it said everything about the man's character that he went to Daniel where maybe other players would have said, no, nah, I'm not quite right. I'm setting myself up for a fall here. I don't really want to put myself out there. No, he went out there, he played and, and did as best as he could, but he wasn't anywhere near the fitness levels he needed to be. And um, sadly, that was probably the beginning of the end for him at Norwich. And uh, from what I've led to believe, what, when he was left out of the 18 against Huddersfield, the opening day of this season, that was when he, he himself had made the decision that he needed to get out and play football. And uh, you wish him nothing but the best. But um, in the interim period, it does pose, and we've already touched on this, it poses Norwich a, a slight dilemma. But uh, I think really for all parties, yeah, it definitely is the best move. And uh, we wish him well and we'll always have Ipswich. Yeah, we will. What a moment that was. Um, a little joke for you, Pad, before uh, we go from Ivan Adcock. I've just seen seven clowns walking towards a big stripy tent on Bungie Common. Given the lockdown rules at present, what does Paddy think? Circus or hashtag dot dot dot? We're, we're three of those seven clowns who are going, I don't know what he's trying to say. But, uh, yeah, maybe, that's, maybe that was that sounds like the actual circus. So yeah, that's that's fine. it's when it the transfer circus that we need to get worried about things. But thankfully, we are now only just over a week away. So roll on this five pm a week today, and then we can pack up the circus and send it out of town. Yeah. So as people who listen to the pod regularly know, I'm campaigning for us to sell hashtag No Circus merchandise. I think it would be uh, you know it's a difficult time for newspapers, but. <laughs> No, only if the profits are coming to my fund, never mind that. <laughs> yeah. They earn enough money as it is. I think you know the answer to that one, mate. Um, <laughs> um, right, let's just rattle through a few bits of the international action and then tee up what we've got coming this weekend. Uh, the England under-21s, that was Wednesday afternoon. That was a bonkers game. Again, covered that one. Live updates at pinkin.com. Uh, 3-3, Max Aaron's played. The full 90 minutes was involved in the build-up for two of the goals, um, but um, Andorra had taken the lead and they equalised in injury time. And, you know, for a, for a small nation like that, they celebrated that like they'd won the World Cup. They were over the moon. So that, that was actually quite entertaining. Max seemed to come through that, no problems. Oliver Skip and Ben Godfrey, of course, no longer an Norwich player, but still of interest to, uh, to Norwich fans. They both stayed on the bench. Um, they have got a game Tuesday night against Turkey at Molyneux, which I'm hopefully going to be at, um, where if they win that, then that will confirm that they've qualified for the final. So um, there's probably a chance that Max plays that as well because Tarek Lamptey pulled out of the squad and um, Rhys James of Chelsea got promoted to the senior squad. So Max may well play that one as well. But you'd have thought that Skip and Godfrey will come in. They seem to basically leave the better players on the bench like Eddie and Ketia, Callum Hudson, and Doy. Um, as Pad mentioned earlier, Tim Krull played for Holland, his first game in, in five years, which is great to see. He could be in goal again on Sunday. They play Bosnia in the Nations League because Jasper Sillison has got a uh, a little bit of a um, of a knot or a doubt over his fitness. Uh, Dan Elsanani also played on. Wednesday for uh, Luxembourg came on for the last 26 minutes of a 2-1 home defeat to Liechtenstein in a friendly and Pat if I can come back to you actually because you were you were following this closely last night weren't you Kenny McLean um, scoring the winning penalty for Scotland so um, <laughs> make it making the headlines yeah I didn't really need that when I was desperately on deadline waiting for Stephen Kenny to tell us what was going on with Ida so Ida sorry so thanks for that the mayor but uh, did you actually catch up on the on the uh, the action because I was watching the Republic game, but um, lovely, cool penalty. I mean, I've seen some quotes from him. Saw an interview with him after the game where uh, you know he said he he wasn't really that nervous and and says everything that he went to Steve Clark and said I want to be the fifth penalty taker. And then apparently before the penalties got underway, uh, a guy who sadly uh, proved he's still a very good shot stopper when we saw him for Derby at the weekend, David Marshall, he went over to him and said make me put me in a position so I'm the hero, i.e. save a penalty or two and then I'll step up. So um, whoever's writing his scripts, uh, let's hope he can uh, pen a few chapters for Norwich because he called that absolutely spot on. And it's great to see, you know, um, you look at that, Scott is set up now and they've got Andy Robertson, they've got John McGinn, they've got some excellent potential players. I like the lad Tierney as well, who obviously missed out last night because of the coronavirus episode. But, you know, they're now one step away and they've got to go to Serbia. That won't be easy next month. But, potentially win that game and that their first tournament since France 98, which is far too long for the Tartan Army, whether they'll be allowed to turn up or not. Well, time will tell. We'll see where we are like next summer. But um, for him personally, yeah, he's a, he's a nice fella as well. Um, not everyone's cup of tea at, at Norwich, as we know, you know, um, but was left out against Derby and, you know, 
he will have gone away and uh, probably wanted to just remind Daniel what he's all about. And it certainly did underline the man's character, as I say, to, to willingly put yourself in the position of greatest jeopardy, potentially, um, and back yourself. And uh, very cool. And uh, good luck to him. And obviously, in dispatches, Michael McGovern with Northern Ireland didn't play. He was on the bench, but they went through as well. So they've now got Slovakia, who obviously knocked out the Republic. So um, it would be nice from a Norwich point of view, if we had one or two interesting people to follow at the Euros next summer, i.e. Tim Krull, um, hopefully Kenny, hopefully Grant Hanley, if he gets himself back in with Scotland and, and maybe Michael McGovern. And, um, that's what it's all about, you know, um, just trying to do it for your club first and foremost. But uh, also, as Kenny said, that's probably going to be the biggest game of his career last night. Um, it's just a whole different level and uh, he's a proud Scotsman and good luck to him. Yeah, and although um, St John Cooper isn't impressed, um, God, it's a penalty you should score. Um, Kenny is a bang average player, but a good squad player for the championship. So um, I'm not sure St John's in, in the best of moods. As I said, he divides opinion. You've just uh, <laughs> had an illustration of that. <laughs> Quite. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up the international stuff and then, Connor, I'll cut, uh, well, I'll come to both of you with a couple of final comments and we will wrap things there. Um, but in terms of today's action, uh, Shemet Poheta isn't with the Poland under 21s because of that um, little hamstring injury which kept him out of the, the derby game. Daniel Farker had already spoken about that. Uh, Jakob Sorensen is with Denmark under 21s there in Malta. That's a five o'clock kickoff. If they win that, they've basically qualified for the under 21s finals next year. Rocky Bashiri with Belgium this evening. They host Wales. Similarly, they're, they're well on course um, to qualify, even though they're in the same group as Germany. And then over the weekend, you've got Sinani playing with Luxembourg. They're at home to Cyprus tomorrow. That's the only game, I think, tomorrow. Then the busy one is Sunday. Uh, at 2pm, you've got um, Ireland v Wales, although uh, as Paddy said at the top of this video, it looks for, unlikely that Adam Ede is going to be involved because he's uh, you know, now gone back to Norwich and things like that with all the uh, the scare over the coronavirus. Um Otherwise, Holland v Bosnia, the one I just uh, mentioned a minute ago, that's at five o'clock. Krull might be involved again. Finland v Bulgaria is five o'clock as well. I have to see whether Pukki comes back. He's had that infected toe, which kept him out of air friendly earlier in the week. Uh, 7.45, Northern Ireland v Austria. Michael McGovern on the bench, or if you like to keep an eye on Jamal Lewis still. Um, and then Scotland v Slovenia, same time as well. Um, Kenny Mack, uh, his opportunity to, to get some more game time with them, potentially. Um, right, just there was one other one from St John Cooper. Good to see Norwich active in the transfer market, spending some of the money we have received, dot, dot, dot. Well, Connor, that, to be fair, I think they've already done the transfer business, haven't they? And the one thing that people always seem to forget a little bit as well is that, you know, OK, it's 25 million deal initially for Ben Godfrey. They don't get all that up front. There's always uh, installments in these deals, aren't there? Yeah, they usually spread about over three years. I think the best example of that, um, I, I remember Stuart Webber still saying that they were paying for Yannick Vildskut, I think off the top of my head, yeah, um, that's a couple right. of years ago. So that's a, that's a good illustration of how deals are done. Um, and and yeah, they, they don't just wake up and see £25 million in, in their bank account. It's not quite how it works. Um, and uh, the way I see those two departures really is, is Jamal Lewis probably covers what they've done in terms of recruitment. And then the Ben Godfrey deal probably covers the um, the, the hole that's been created by coronavirus, plus a, a bit extra for, for contingency, I guess, for, for however long that goes on. So those two deals probably put them in a better place financially. Um, and, and that's the nature of their self-sustainability, I'm afraid. And not everyone likes it, but whilst they are a self-sustainable club, they are going to need to sell players. That's that's the nature of how you keep the, the wheel turning, you keep the model running. So um not really sure I, I sort of buy the argument that they're a selling club because everyone's a selling club. Um, I think when, when Lionel Messi wants to leave Barcelona, I don't think you can really throw that at anyone. So um, that, that, that for me is, is quite a redundant argument. But I mean, they've signed, what, 11 players this window. So it's not like they haven't been active and, and they haven't. Um, so I, I I get it. I get the frustrations because no one wants to see Norwich's best players depart, particularly supporters. But that will always be the case, I'm afraid, um, certainly whilst we're sort of under this current ownership model. Um, and until there is another party in town, essentially, sort of any other arguments are redundant, I'm afraid, because that's the way they choose to run themselves. And um, I think they've they've proved over the last few years with, with Madison and, and, and Godfrey and 
players like this that he can prove successful in terms of what they're trying to do, which is develop young talent and, and then sell them. And even if you think back to, to Craig Bellamy and, and players like that, it's always been the case at Norwich City and um, it's it's not new, but that doesn't mean that it, it hurts any less. So so I get the frustration. Um, yeah, it's, it is what it is, but they, financially they're, they're in a very good place. And if, if, if they don't, if, if they do sell a player rather, then um, under Stuart Webber, you know that they're, they're going to be selling for for a fairly decent fee. I think as they've proven, I, I, I keep sort of thinking back to the Murphys now and, and maybe what good business that was at the fees they got for them. So um understand the frustration, but unfortunately that's the way they decide to run the club. So it's, it's always going to be the case that players depart. It is, yeah. Um, Graham Leader, I think, might have got slightly wrong in the stick here. So we don't get all the money up front when we sell a player, but we do have to pay all the money when we sign no, one. No, I mean, no. that's that's not that's not what Connor was saying. You know, we're talking about much bigger deals here, aren't we? We're not talking about two million, three million deals. We're talking about twenty-five million deals. So they're they're structured in different ways. But that that wasn't what what Connor was saying. Um, what else? Uh, and St John Cooper again. We need we don't need to sell. That's just not true. I mean. When Stuart Webber says things like that, of course, that that's kind of a negotiating tactic, isn't it? That's um, and they didn't need to sell; they weren't on the verge of financial uh, problems. But of course, with the, this continually developing situation with coronavirus, that financial hole is getting bigger and bigger. So, you know, as we've been saying right from the start in all these sort of videos and podcasts and stuff, we all knew that they were going to sell one or two players, that or that it was very highly likely. So, you know, yeah, obviously, when Stuart's talking about those sort of things, there is um. There's very much purpose in, in what he's saying, isn't there? Um, and right, I, I think there was a couple of questions which I can wrap into one for you, Pad. Um, which uh, let me just scroll back to them. Others, Simon Parker uh, Palmer. Sorry. Um, do you see the rise of Kingsling being good for City? And will they get their own tab on the Pink and website? Local football seems unfair. Well, um, keep your um, eyes open for that. There may be a, a, a redesign on the way on the Pink and website. But they do. It, to be fair, if you scroll down just a little bit, they do have their own section there, um, even if they don't have a tab at the top. But they do on the, the EDP website and things like that. Um, yes, great to see the Linux doing well. A good start. And Simon Power scoring from the other night. Um, Archie Mayer is there as well. So, We'll see whether he gets into the team. Uncle but, uh, Dale. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Dale, yeah, Dale Southwell, yeah. Um, right, yeah, I'll try and roll these into two for you, Pad. Um, Steve Wells, with the last few results, what do you think Farker needs to fix and what players does he need? And then sort of making that a little bit more uh, specific from Ivan Adcock. Here's a serious one. Do you think Farker needs to prove that he can get the best out of a player once he's fallen out with them? See Oliveira, Leitner, and the pending couple, Campwell. Oh, <laughs> I obviously said something that sounded like Siri because my phone just turned on. I'll read that again. Here's a serious one. Do you think Farker needs to prove that he can get the best out of a player once he's fallen out with them? See Oliveira, Leitner, and pending couple, Campwell and Wendia. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't kind of on the scale of blow ups. I wouldn't put where he is with Wendia and Campwell alongside. Certainly, Oliveira and probably Leitner as well, which was full blown uh, divorce proceedings. And uh, there was no ba way back for them characters. I mean, Buendia post Bournemouth came back in against Derby. So, so to me, there, there's your making up straight away, you know. Um, Cantwell, he decided wasn't going to be in his plans for this weekend. I think with Cantwell, they just. They just need to get the window closed and then we won't have to deal with infernal speculation about him going to Leeds. Now, if something materialises of a firm nature and uh, it's right for all parties, then he'll be gone and it won't be an issue. But if he is still here beyond a week tomorrow, then I'm pretty sure that they can bring that lad back on side because it's not really in his interest to uh, basically be sat parked, not playing football between now and January because if ultimately he, he wants to move on, he feels he's now a Premier League player, as Jamal did, as Ben Godfrey did, um, which is a a point I did want to make about you know about Norwich saying they don't need to sell and then they do sell. It's not just about what Norwich want; it's about what these players want. You know, and, and don't you can come back to me and say, well, they're under contract, but contracts in football do me a favour. You know, ultimately, it's uh, a lot of the time if if the player and his agents decide that they want to move on, then then they can make life very uncomfortable for the football club. So so it isn't just one moving part in these dramas, and uh, that brings me back to Camp. Well, if if he's still here, then I'm pretty sure Daniel will be able to bring him back on side. So I wouldn't be necessarily worried that we're now at Oliveira levels of uh, fallout uh, with those two guys. Uh, and in terms of what does he need to fix? Well, 
pretty obvious. Two games, 60 plus percent possession in both. No goals, not really too many chances in terms of clear cut. David Marshall made a couple of good saves. Quite an embarrassing penalty episode, but uh, it's not really enough for two games where you've had 60 percent plus possession. So, whether it's personnel, whether it's actually how they set about it, um, they need to change something in the final third. And uh, if they do that, then they look like, to me, they've got a solid base. I, I like what I've seen from Gibson early days, I know. But if you had him and Zimmerman and Max is still here and you've got Quintilla and Krull and you've got Skip and potentially Rob, um, that's not a bad base in terms of six players. It is all about the top end of the pitch because, unfortunately, as Derby and Bournemouth did, they're going to get that again. They're going to get that at Rotherham. They're going to get that most weeks. Teams will say, no, we're not taking you on at a game of football. We're going to sit here. We're going to frustrate you and then we're going to hit you on the counter. And if Norwich don't come up with a plan, if Farker doesn't come up with a plan, we're going to be in for a bit more frustration, I think. And uh, he knows that better than anyone. He's in the business of winning games. He's not done that anywhere near enough over the, say, course of the last 12 months. Uh, but no longer is he in the Premier League and saying we're, you know, we're fighting without any ammunition in our gun or whatever Weber came out with. He, he is still got a squad who are more than good enough to be at the top end of this division. And one win in four is not good enough. So uh, things do need to change rapidly. Indeed. Right. Uh, just a couple of last comments from, from Sir John Cooper again. Uh, if we are in the bottom half of the table at Christmas, will Farker's position become vulnerable? I think that's he's, pretty- he's a cheery soul today, that lad, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's he in a good mood. <laughs> um, cheer up, mate. Want to cheer up, pal. It's, uh, that's pretty certain. If, if Norwich are anywhere near relegation trouble near Christmas, I think we know Stuart Webber is ruthless and he's, he's talked about how he will be. And um, same again to John Cooper. David, OK, don't mind a few sales, but we should replace those players with some quality, surely. Well, Ben Gibson, Javi Quintia, you know, you can't you can't buy another Ben Godfrey or Jamal Lewis easily in the championship. The, the one who I, I think particularly would be in very very difficult to replace would be Wendy. I just uh, you know he was um, a, a dream signing really it worked out so well um, but uh, and of course we as we spoke at the top of the show we're, we, we've got this final week to see how they replace closer or if they do or if they go with uh, with the young lad um, there's a couple of other comments but they are sort of talking about um, the uh, things that we've already discussed earlier in the video so I think we'll leave it there thanks very much for, for joining us uh, this lunchtime um, I think we just just about covered everything that's going on um, but for now we'll, we'll catch up with you um, we'll catch up with you very soon um, and th- thank you very much for watching.